Ah, hello, dear friends, and welcome back to this next installment of Inventing the Modern World. Today we're going to take a look at the industrial city, a very interesting topic. Can you imagine what it must have been like to have lived at a time where agriculture being set against a rural backdrop had all of a sudden been taken over by huge smokestacks and brickwork and steam. Here's a quote from Charles Dickens from the novel Harder Times in 1854. It was a town of machinery. Thank you. 
19th century. Many businesses sold plaster casts of actual heads, often sets of felons or unworthies for use in lectures at mechanics and town institutes. These are from the Wadebridge Institute in Cornwall. Because many towns boasted literary and philosophical societies and mechanics institutes devoted to providing rational amusement to refine the tastes and soften the manners of city dwellers of all classes. Scientific subjects, including chemistry, optics and phrenology, were popular constituents of the many lecture courses run in such institutions. The phrenology mapped different mental faculties in two specific areas of the brain. Palpable as bumps on the surface of the skull. After a brief period of acceptance by medical men, it was mainly used by ordinary people to guide their lives in the disorientating world of the industrial centres. So that's interesting. Phrenology is the term for it. If you've ever seen one of those um, busts, which um, on the top of the head is kind of divided into all these little grids, and there are little um, names for each of the grids within them, I suppose, detailing what part of the brain is responsible for what, which is, of course, um, not to re uh, uh, um, acknowledged in modern neuroscience, but phrenology, that's what that was called. Wonderful photos here, splendid municipal buildings, constructed to foster a sense of identity in the rapidly expanding cities. So this is the town hall in Berlin, completed in 1869, Sheffield in Yorkshire, opened in 1897, the new state house in Boston in 1795, and here's the uh, Midland Grand Hotel which is um, part of the Midland Railway St. Pancras Terminal, London. If you go to London today to St. Pancras, this is there as an absolutely, truly magnificent building amongst the hustle and bustle of a very urban area. It's a wonderful building. Pollution and urban squalor, that's of course a big consideration and is often something we think about isn't it, when we think of um, the Industrial Revolution and that time. So from industrial plants, sewerage and rubbish were generated by growing numbers of people and creating a logistical nightmare in cities for lacking both the means and the laws to dispose of waste safely. Smoke from an early Manchester mill here and the great dust heap at King's Cross in London create huge piles of ashes from a nearby brickworks which accumulated for decades before finally being removed in the 1820s. Look at that. It's an illustration. So you've got, um, that's the house in the background for comparison and some trees. And this dust pile is as equally tall. It's horrendous, isn't it? Could you imagine the respiratory conditions created by being near that? Here's a rather staged depiction by the um, photographer Oscar Gustave Rayanda in New York. Yes, it does look a bit like a um, something that you'd have in a play, doesn't it? Grinding poverty was the lot of many city dwellers and street urchins sleep rough here in New York in the 1890s. So from the late 18th century, the squalid domestic and working lives of the denizens of the industrial towns troubled the imaginations of novelists, social commentators and doctors. Poverty and squalor may well have been commonplace in the villages, but writers including Henry Mayhew and Charles Dickens focused on the human degradation of the new cities. So in the novel Hard Times that we saw a quote from before, Dickens portrayed the fictitious coke town as a soulless machine governed place dominated by textile mills where there was a rattling and a trembling all day long and where the piston of the steam engine worked monotonously up and down like the head of an elephant in a state of melancholy madness for the Tocqueville Manchester in 1835 was a new Hades with polluted air and water rubbish piled high in the streets and people crammed into cellars described as repulsive holes. This is a census from 1841 showing us the country's 18.5 million residents were obliged to give personal details such as their name, occupation and approximate age. 
bitterly resented by many as an invasion of privacy. Census data provided the first complete picture of Britain's population, provided vital for planning and on the local and national level. And this is a London directory here, uh, from a post office directory of London, illustrating the wide social mix to be found in the big cities. While some streets consisted of aristocratic residences, others housed small businessmen or shops and workshops. Look at this fantastic beard and moustache. Uh, Cozy, well upholstered and carefully posed. Surrounds could only be enjoyed by a few. Note the rings of the wife's crinoline framework to support her skirt in the foreshadowing in the in the foreground technology that aided shadowing uh, that aided fashion here so you've got the kind of um, almost like a basket that you would hang the skirt in is that fascinating this is the difference engine number three built on the principle of the babbage engine an actual machine used by the general register office eliminating errors of calculation and transcription by printing multiple copies of tables using paper mache plates. Ill health seemed a compelling index of the dangerous anarchy of urban growth and statistical analysis of the health of towns that had already become established at a national level in Britain. From the time of William Farr's preface to the first GRO and annual report in 1839, this data was analysed to show geographical differences in causes of death. And then new technologies were used to process the masses of data and identify urban problems using machines like this. Cholera, smallpox, tuberculosis, dysentery, typhus and typhoid were among many of the diseases suffered by the populations of the industrial cities. Asiatic cholera, which had broken out in India. In um, 1817 spread across Asia, North Africa, Russia and to Western Europe, reaching Britain and Ireland in 1831. And a year later it arrived in the Americas. In Britain alone 30,000 people died, although the total deaths from cholera across the century were not many compared to those caused by undifferentiated cases of common fever. In 1854-5, in a third epidemic that bore particularly heavily on parts of London, the medical man John Snow calculated that the incidence of cholera was considerably higher amongst those who drank water pumped from a well in Broad Street in Soho. So removing the pump handle caused a slump in incidence. In his separate study of cases amongst people served by different private water companies also provided evidence for his argument that cholera was a waterborne disease. Disinfectors here were employed by local authorities to administer disinfectant chemicals where infectious diseases appeared. General standards of cleanliness were low. This was seen by many as a largely ineffective measure, dismissed as futile ceremony by John Simon, medical office of the General Board of Health. Here's a preventative costume from 1832 and the state doctor satirical views of cholera, revealing the variety of responses provoked by the uh, epidemics. The Doctor was one of a series which also featured a publican fearing the spread of cholera, presumably because of um, lost earnings, and an undertaker hoping to profit from it. Deaths from smallpox declined across the century in the industrial cities with the exception of London, and epidemics, particularly that of 1871-2, to were felt across Britain. Alone among infectious diseases, smallpox had a specific preventative vaccination, which was first publicised by Edward Jenner in 1798. And although it was adopted with electricity in France when Napoleon introduced compulsory vaccination in the army, the practice provoked much resistance in Britain. And in 1853, the British government passed the Vaccination Act, making it compulsory for all infants in the first three months of life. And there was vigorous campaigning against the Act, on the grounds that compulsion was against the rights.
rights of the individual and vaccination against nature. And in 1898 it was amended so that the objectors were permitted to refuse vaccinations of their infants. Isn't that fascinating? This book is decades old itself, written well before Covid. And of course, we experienced similar things in response to vaccination then as we did here. It's just within human nature it seems. Contemporary medical theory offered various explanations for the health problems of the urban working class and doctors such as William Cullen and his pupil William Allison, for example, were trained in the new environmental medical theory of the 18th century. They saw the disproportionate incidence of fever amongst the poor as the product of debility caused by social environmental factors, including diet, poor clothing, housing, lack of warmth, long hours of employment and the fumes and airlessness of many workplaces. But the breadth of this concern was displaced in the middle third of the 19th century by those who promoted political economy as the basis of rational government. The single issue of filth and the engineering required to remove it took the place of the total environment as the explanation of urban ill health. Here's a, a depiction by the French artist Louis Leopold de Boilly in 1807. Once smallpox vaccinations became compulsory, many different types of vaccination lancets were developed by doctors. So the Malam vaccinator from 1874 up here uh, scratched the skin with gilded steel teeth. That must have been horrible for a young child because of course just even having a needle vaccination can be quite harrowing for some but to have something that just straight up scraped your skin off to insert the disease into it is uh, is harrowing here's a mob attacking the quarantine station at the New York Marine Hospital in 1858 where many people believe that such hospitals were responsible for epidemics also fascinating isn't it how history repeats itself regardless of access to information education technology human nature will always remain the same it seems so ventilation is a topic here where um, ventilation of the home school and workplace vigorously promoted in the closing decades of the 19th century as in the case of the boil system of ventilation Robert Boyle also published a series of pamphlets entitled Sanitary Crusades. And the water here, the beam engine and boiler houses of the Nottingham Waterworks of 1856 were a project of Thomas Hawksley, first an ally and then an opponent of Edwin Chadwick. For the first three quarters of the 19th century, water was generally supplied to the towns by commercial undertakings. Sometimes several companies competed to provide water for the same district. It wasn't then commonplace for water to be piped into the industrial dwellings of the poor, and all supplies were originally at low pressure and intermittent. Consumers would fill a cistern or a bucket to last for several days until the supply was next turned on. The engineer Thomas Hawksley applied his experience of gas supply, in which gas is conveyed under pressure and sealed pipework, to provide a constant water supply to 8,000 homes in Nottingham. From 1830. He was one of the many engineers who moved into sanitation, installing miles of underground pipes and building steam powered pumping stations to feed water from great distances. So fascinating, isn't it? The human endeavour to look at these problems that are set in place to this very day, just seeing where it comes from. Here are the Imperial Gas Works at King's Cross. Redot house in the 1870s with workers shoveling coal into the ovens. So gas and heating and lighting was produced by heating coal in the absence of air and in a large number of such gas works. These distributed gas at low pressure locally and like today's high pressure natural gas networks that distribute gas over long distances. This is a hygiene cabinet, a lecture cabinet from 1895 made by Charles Campbell member of the Royal Sanitary Institute, containing miniature day drainage and sewerage fittings, sanitary appliances, ventilation equipment for teaching the principles of hygiene to training medical officers of health. So the provision of systems to remove human sewerage and drain away rainwater became invested with utopian values. Civil engineers may have been the first to install new sanitary infrastructures, but it was a British 
Irish civil servant to exalted sanitation and made it the core ideology of public health. Edwin Chadwick is often seen as a reforming zealot, held the vision of an ulterior venous system in which clean water would be introduced into the towns to act as a vehicle to transport disease-causing excrement and other filth to the countryside, where it would then be sold as manure, generating enough profit to pay for the construction of the sewers. He argued vehemently with engineers that glazed pipes should be used in preference to brick sewers, which they favoured to carry waste away from the cities, and the smaller the pipes he contended the faster would disease-causing filth be removed. But civil uh, engineers such as Joseph Bazalgette, who created the main London system, and the uh, associated Thames Embankment didn't agree with Chadwick's theories. Bathclet's scheme involved the construction of 82 miles of brick sewers beneath London and used pumping stations to discharge the waste. So when completed in 1865, the system was capable of dealing with 420 million gallons of sewage and rainwater daily. And most of Bathclet's system is still in use today. A water mania swept Europe, resulting in new sewage and water supply infrastructure in virtually every major northwestern European city by the close of the century. Vast Parisian streets doubled in length under the town planner Baron Haussmann. The sewers increased more than fivefold, and in the United States the 16 largest cities all had waterworks by 1860. The other major practical measure taken by health reformers was the ventilation of buildings. Many citizens preferred to seal their homes against miasma and smoke, but numerous public buildings were fitted with roof-mounted ventilators and ground-level inlets, which can still be seen today. It is so fascinating how long um, these things have existed for. So here's the Thames Embankment shown under the construction in 1867. This was um, the northern outfall sewer near the Abbey Mills pumping station, an integral part of the scheme where sewage gathered here from London was pumped eastward for eventual discharge into the river well away from the city. That is apparently Battle Get there with some tremendous top hat. But it's fascinating, isn't it, that these systems are still in use today. If you're not aware, there is a huge undertaking currently throughout the infrastructure of the UK to actually replace the Victorian piping systems, the waterworks, you can only really rely on um, infrastructure that's over a hundred years old, well over a hundred years old for so long. Here in the New York slums, in 1887, photographed by Jacob Rees, a reporter who later became a social reformer, and whole families dwelled in makeshift housing. Look at it, it's just cobbled together boards and sheeting in a courtyard and a new word, slum, which was passed from slang to orthodox use during the first half of the century to describe poorly built and deteriorating areas of housing, was often associated with poverty and disease. So the pace of migration into the towns had brought heavy overcrowding that increased the risk of epidemics. Some employers, such as David Dale and later Robert Owen at New Lanark, Titus Salt at Saltaire and the Lever Brothers at Port Sunlight, and Crump at Essen, provided model housing for their workers, but in an age where virtually all domestic property was rented, many landlords saw little point in improving their properties. And in Britain, societies were formed to construct improved housing for the working classes. Later, from the 1860s, private bodies such as the Peabody Trust built blocks of model dwellings. More extensive improvements in housing came with the spread of active local government equipped with greater powers after World War I. Of course, the irony these days that you can see Peabody Trust um, buildings built around central London, some kind of key areas of London, because of their location in this day and age. If you wanted to buy one, then you, you're talking around the million mark for a small dwelling. It's um, outrageous. So New Lanark, where education and the healthcare were provided for the cotton mill workers in the opening decades of the 19th century, like this um, and put sunlight here on the right to build from 1887 onwards are a complex containing 800 houses 
houses, a library, museum, two schools and a technical institute for soap makers. It's beautiful, isn't it? Lovely. And this is Essen in Germany. But the influx into the city was so rapid that fewer than one in 30 could be accommodated in such buildings. And again, look at the quality of these lovely buildings. In this day and age, only a select few would be able to afford them. These are gas works, the Greenwich gas works on the site of um, the Millennium Dome now, actually. This is called the Fido Magellan, a gas cooker, provided by Alexis Sawyer, a famous French chef. There, of course, is a gas lamp. In Glasgow from 1866, local government intervention led to urban renewal. And city services were improved, parks were provided, and a municipal centre and art gallery were built. And under the leadership of Joseph Chamberlain, using Glasgow's model, Birmingham embarked on a scheme of slum clearance and urban regeneration from 1875 onwards. Here and elsewhere in the industrialised world, areas were set aside as public parks, parks and amenities such as sanitation, gas lighting and paving were slowly extended to the poorer areas. Gas lighting is of course the way in which streets were lit up. Here is a street lamp in the Piazza di Monte Cavallo in Rome. In a uh, 1841 type by Alexander John Ellis. So it was first used to light London streets in 1812. Gas lamps appeared in all major industrial cities over the following decades. After dark, much of the urban life became dependent on gas lamps, both inside and on the streets. The Underground. Chancellor of the Exchequer, William Gladstone, his wife and other notables, are pictured here at Edgware Station, London. May 1862, the first trial journey of the Metropolitan Railway, the world's first underground line, linking Paddington Station in the west of the city in the east. They were hauled by steam engines, which produced unpleasant fumes in the confined tunnels. That would be horrible. Look at that. You're in carts, completely exposed to the elements, and a steam train that's going to go into a confined tunnel that will then choke you. I mean, I know I complain sometimes about the underground travel in this day and age, about how hot and cramped it can be sometimes, but at least I'm not breathing in noxious fumes in the dark. Throughout the century, the urban landscape was shaped and reshaped by new forms of transport, and from 1830, railways linked larger towns, and the system was soon extended to serve the suburbs. Railway lines often cut through slum areas, displacing the poor, and influenced the pattern of subsequent urban growth drawn trams which appeared in America during the 1850s were to be seen in European cities during the 1860s and 1870s and by 1900 electric trams were a feature of many major towns permitting rapid transit to the suburbs of course taller buildings could be constructed as technology evolved skyscraper arrived with the opening of the home insurance building in Chicago. New utilities were added alongside water and gas pipes and sewers. From 1871, in London and other major cities, hydraulic power companies supplied water under high pressure through underground pipes to power not just elevators, machine tools and dock cranes, but also the revolving stages of several theatres. A pneumatic tube, a system delivered paper copies of telegrams between the central telegraph office and a network of post offices from 1850s onwards. During the 1880s and 90s, the London skyline was marked by large numbers of telephone poles and wires. In 1892's Telegraph Act, however, prevented a worsening of this problem by permitting companies to install cables underground. So, usually built to house large corporations, these helped to transform the centers of many American cities in the 1880s. Stunning feats of engineering, aren't they, when you think about it? Here's 
instantly matic tube mail transmitter at Brooklyn Post Office in New York in 1899. 500 letters could be dispatched at a time through the tube to New York General Post Office, nearly two miles away. Covered 27 miles, remained in use until 1953. And here's the New York Elevated Railroad. It was one of the city's main forms of urban transport. the 
said he stood for everything that was unhealthy in the modern world. And after the 1880s, when faith in unlimited economic progress diminished, many commentators pondered what Thomas Carlyle had originally called the condition of England question. And it wasn't until 1892 that Engels' book was first published and widely read in England. Central Park here, back in the day, not as landscaped as it is now, of course. But it was the first landscape public park in the US model on the public spaces of London and Paris. Opened in 1859, it involved the transformation of over 800 acres of swampland and the dispersal of shanty communities. About 20,000 workers moved nearly 3 million cubic yards of earth and planted over a quarter of a million trees. And Mayor Ali's obelisk was erected here. This is typical working class housing in 1890s London and the inhabitants shared water taps and a gutter ran through the centre of the road. And if these kind of buildings still exist in London, of course, they will set you back in the millions for being loft house conversions. Yosemite Natural National Park, of course, placing um, areas of outstanding natural beauty under the government's protection was one practical response to urbanisation and the disappearance of large tracts of wilderness or countryside. Yosemite, which was established in 1890, had its roots in the special nature reserve set up by Abraham Lincoln in 1864. And you also have the concept of garden cities. Here's Letchworth, a practical experiment in creating rural values within an urban setting. One consequence of the anti-urban trend was a romanticization of the rural environment portrayed as a healthy and clean alternative to the horrors of the city. This trend was strongest in Britain, the most urbanised country. From the beginning this involved a return to an imaginary past, which I think again is still rife today. In Britain in 1846 the radical politician Fergus O'Connor launched his land plan to enable town dwellers to return to the village. Forty years later, Jesse Collings, a mainstream politician, could still coin the slogan three acres and a cow to sum up what he believed to be the aspirations of many British town dwellers. The notion of the rural idyll persisted. Earlier in the 20th century it found concrete expression in Letchworth, the first of the garden cities, founded by Ebenezer Howard and designed by Raymond Unwin. So that brings us on to the age of the engineer and I think a good place to put a pin in it for now. Thank you so much for joining me of this explanation at the industrial